Hello, I'm Santa Everson from Fair Divorce, and today we're going to be talking about sex and orgasms in particular. 21 December is World Orgasm Day, and with me to talk about that and all matters relevant to that is Marilu Gabba. She is a sex, love, and relationship coach. Marilu, thank you very much for being here and welcome. Hi, Santa. Thanks. It's so nice to be here. Wonderful. As you know, I work with people who are going through separation and divorce. So I was thinking uh, with the people that I work with, maybe we can start with the things that are generally uh, factors that put us off sex in a relationship. Mm. If I can start there. And, and the things that come to mind is childbirth, breastfeeding afterwards, um, maybe boredom once you've been together for a number of years the, the oomph is gone there's no more spark there something else that i'm thinking of is um that is actually a very high and very uh, uh, common cause for separation and divorce is uh, cheating or infidelity mm. which i am sure has a great impact on your sex life uh, i know from personal experience also it puts you off completely from having wanting to be intimate with a partner if they've been unfaithful to you and something else also um that has had a huge impact on me personally and I've, I've worked with so many women specifically who had the same effect is when your husband takes a younger lover somebody who is literally decades younger than you that has a huge impact on your self-image and your self-worth and your your view of yourself as a, as a sexual and sensual person. Um, so starting with that, just some things that came up that initially puts us off sex. What, what can you tell us more about that in your experience? Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I can just comment on that in general. So all of the things that you said are very true, right? And I think in relationships, not being sexually satisfied like it can go one of two ways either it can cause a lot of resentment in a couple right it can cause um, a feeling of distance or isolation um or, or some couples are actually very happy just almost becoming roommates right so you can actually have a sustained marriage or relationship with no sexual interaction but i think it's a minority of couples that would uh, be comfortable with that. It's kind of like if both partners aren't really inter interested in sex and like they won't go looking for it outside of the relationship or desire to have that in the relationship and then feel that longing for it and constantly feel like they can't be met. Um, but I do think it's something, as you said, like there's all these life events, something like childbirth, um, stress, work, um, infidelity, all of these big life events that happen to some people, doesn't happen to other, that has a big impact on how we feel sexually. And this to me points to this idea that sex is such a psychological thing. Desire is such a psychological thing. Oftentimes when we think of sex, and I know we're going to talk about orgasm a bit. So for example, women who struggle to orgasm might think that it's a very physiological thing or problem where most often it is a psychological thing because sex and how we feel in our bodies, how we feel in our psychology is so deeply connected. So I think it's always good for you to look at or good for people to look at um, where are they mentally, emotionally, spiritually um, when they're trying to figure this out. So it's true that it's all in the head at the end of the day. <laughs> in a big way it is, in a big way it is. Like there are obvious cases where it is something physiological and I'm including, for example, hormones in this, right? That there is a hormonal imbalance that can be true, but what I have found in my work is most of the time, it's it's all in the head. <laughs> and then uh, talking about physiological things, I know that menopause also plays quite a role. Yes. Um, yeah. There are physical challenges as well. Man. Yeah, there are physical challenges, but again, even that, the psychology of menopause for me is a, it's a social cultural thing as well. And I'm really just speaking from what I've learned in my studies and speaking to other women because I haven't, I, I'm not in menopause or I haven't gone through menopause yet. But in the East, in China and Japan, people have a very different view of menopause. So the culture looks at menopause differently. And I'm very involved in like women's groups where these women are almost trying to reclaim um, old, how can I call it, like um, more empowering uh, 
thought patterns around like who we are as women and where menopause is an initiation into being the wise woman being the crone so there's more of an empowering narrative around moving into menopause where generally in the west is a very disempowering narrative right so menopause equals you dry up you're useless your 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 vagina shrivels up right even in the medical industry there's a lot of disempowering language around menopause and in general, I feel women don't really have the tools to move into menopause gracefully. Also, they don't have the support from the medical industry, from uh, women around them. But if you look, you will find pockets of thought where you can find a more empowering narrative. And there are practices, right? There are Taoist practices that can actually help you move through menopause in a more um, graceful manner where you don't have such hormonal fluctuations and you don't have such a... Um, uh, extreme physical reactions, but it is, it does require like a bit of consciousness and awareness and almost, I want to say work around who you are as a menopausal woman. Yeah. But in the, in the fields that I'm in, I hear of many, many women who have the best sex of their lives as like post menopause, right? Yeah. Where like they take lovers for the first time when they're in their seventies. So I, I know of um, anecdotal stories of many, many women who's honestly embraced menopause in such a beautiful way and are having a great time. That sounds wonderful. I detect another topic for another interview here <laughs> at another time. All right, so um, on your website, it says that you do personal coaching, but you also do couples coaching. Yes. So after everything we've just talked about, how does that affect men also, the same, the same things that we've talked about? Um, childbirth affects men in a way because maybe a woman is not as available, not as interested, uh, exhausted and stressed and all of that. And even infidelity, it happens, uh, you know, to the best of us. And yeah. how does that affect men as well? Yeah. Um, so it's more like how does it affect men in like longer term relationships or having these, having these big life events? Yeah. So if we specifically focus on how it affects men's sexuality, their desire, um, again, like there's, there's a psychology around it because even around birth, men might feel, and if we're talking about heterosexual couples now, right, and especially maybe with the first child, men might feel that where they used to get all of the attention and all of the touch, they're not the first recipient of all of that touch anymore. Yes. And so the, what I hear a lot from women is like they get so much touch when they have you know, bonding time with the baby, like they're almost like overtouched and they're not maybe as available to men. So men can feel a sense of rejection, mm. um, which is not what it's, it's not meant to be like that, but it can be perceived like that. Mm. Also, if men don't really know what their role is now in this, like rearing of the baby, in this nurturing of the baby, because it's very much like the nurturing comes from the mother, if the man doesn't really understand how he now fits into this picture, it can also lead to a bit of an identity crisis, like feeling like they're not um, as useful anymore or feeling like they don't really fit into this picture anymore, especially in the beginning stages. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for couples to almost come to agreements of how they will parent together, like have conversations around it and also have conversations around like what are your before childbirth? Like, like what are your biggest fears about becoming a father, or what are your biggest fears of us maybe not having sex for two months, or like how can we find ways to still connect intimately if I feel depleted and exhausted, right? So when I do couples coaching, I feel the most the key for me for any couple is to have good communication skills, and it is constantly surprising to me how many couples don't talk about these things don't have honest conversations about where each of them are at and how to meet in the middle and then the same with their sex lives as well like i meet many 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 couples that don't know how to talk about sex so they don't know how to talk about not just what they desire but what they yeah what they desire from a sexual relationship maybe they struggle to talk about um like their fantasies or um, things that they would like to try because there's shame around it or there's a fear of rejection around it and it really doesn't serve anyone in the couple to not be able to have those conversations so I think learning communication skills and it is a learnable skill I think is one of the biggest gifts that you can give yourself in a relationship definitely I agree with you and it also depends largely for many of us on how we were raised 
Yes. To even just get to a point where we're comfortable to just express what we enjoy and how we like to be touched and, and not. Um, yeah. It sounds like a very simple thing, but that's almost like the starting point in an intimate relationship is being able Absolutely. to indicate what what mm. works for you, so to speak, what um, arouses you and what uh, doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And that's why there are specific, almost like practices that you can do, which is like a step-by-step methodology in a way of like learning how to express these things because it might feel awkward. Or as I said, I think a lot of the holding back in both men and women is a fear of rejection or a fear of looking stupid. Mm. And um, yeah, and that's why most people would rather not say something than say something and feel idiotic afterwards, right? But there, there are practices that you can do, which is a, a contained environment to learn these things. And that then becomes, uh, that spills over into their day-to-day relationship and makes it easier for people to communicate. Well, that's good to know. So there's a step to, mm. step-by-step uh, program, so to speak, that, that one can follow to, get, yeah. to learn those skills. That's absolutely absolutely or just even to learn like how to ask so there's there's a practice that i love doing with couples which is honestly my favorite mm-hmm. uh, even in my own relationship um and it's called what can i offer you right now right so one partner so you have a timer so it's like for the next five minutes one partner just asks their partner what can i offer you right now and the idea is that you go in from a place of service you're not expecting anything in return you're not like being weird about it. You just ask, what can I offer you right now? And the other partner, the receiver gets to say um, whatever they want, you know, maybe make me a cup of tea or massage my feet or kiss my forehead. Um, and then after a minute, you ask again, what can I offer you right now? So that you can also learn as the receiver, your desire is allowed to change. Because maybe you ask for a back tickle and then your partner starts and then you don't enjoy it, but then you don't want to tell them because you don't want to make them feel bad. So it works on so many levels on helping couples to become comfortable with asking for what they want, offering some physical touch, um, changing their minds halfway through. Like it's a, so simple, this practice, but really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it really sounds very simple, very basic, mm. but so, so, basic. so important. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, let's get into the nitty gritty of things. So let's say I'm, I, I was in a relationship that has now broken down for whatever reason, but there's some, I, I've been affected on a sexual level. Uh, I'm not interested in sex. I don't feel sexy, I uh, feel fat and ugly or whatever it is. I'm rejected because my partner took a lover that's 25 years younger than I am and left me for her and here I am and I think I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life and I don't want, mm. I'm not interested in ever being intimate with anybody else. I just I just want to switch off and carry on like that. Where do you start yeah. with somebody in that position? Yeah. How do I get um, back, how do I tap back into my body because our bodies are made for, for pleasure and ecstasy and all those wonderful things. Yeah. So it it might sound counterintuitive because when you're in a place of pain, pleasure seems like such a foreign thing, right? Even to think of pleasure might seem like a ridiculous idea. And so to, to, to speak to someone who's like really in a place of pain and feeling rejected and like maybe not feeling a lot of love for themselves to then go, you know, make ecstatic love to yourself. Like it's such a stretch. So what I would recommend is, really tapping into what we call embodiment practices. So anything where you can like really get into your body. So a very simple thing is dancing, right? Mm -hmm. So dancing is something you can do on your own. It is something that puts you back in your body and it's something where you can express. And what I have found is like the more you dance, especially if you do something like conscious dance. And I know where we live, there's stuff like uh, five rhythms or Nia or um, conscious dance. Like there's a lot of, places that you can go to where people are facilitating these types of dance and you're on your own and no one else cares what you look like and it can be extremely liberating to just get back into your body through something like that um other things that you can do you know like if you're on your own like go for a massage like just to have touch again but where the, where it's not sexual where there's no expectation of return but just to connect with another human being again because I do feel like as human beings, we, we crave touch 
And I've seen in periods of my life where I was single for a very long time, I became what I called at that time skin hungry. It's like I really yes. deeply desire just the touch of another person's skin on mine, but because I didn't want to have one night stands and I wasn't in a relationship, it was hard for me to find that. And regular massage just kind of filled my cup in that way. So in, if you are on your own and you're in a very bad place, you might want to just crawl in under the covers and cry for a week and that's fine as well. But set some places, like create some activities for yourself or join some activities where you don't need to talk to anyone. We don't need to tell your story, but where you can receive and where you can be in your body. I think it's very, very helpful. Then there's a bunch of other modalities, right? Like you can go to whatever, like a drumming circle or go for breath work. Breath work is a very releasing practice as well. Um, go for a walk in the forest, but do things that feel good in your body so that you can reconnect your body in a very non-sexual way. And then later on, when you start feeling more home in your body and you don't have to be like 100% on the self-love train yet, um, I would say to start doing things like self-massage, um, sensual massage for yourself. For women, definitely breast massage because the breasts are so connected to the heart. And if the heart is tender and broken and hurting, giving yourself a very soft, slow, gentle breast massage with like nice oils, like unscented oils, it, it can really, really open up a lot. So it's something I recommend to all my female clients is to have breast massage as a practice in their in their week. Interesting. I love the term skin hungry. I can so mm. relate to that. And, and I think most of the people that I work with that are separated or going through a divorce are, are skin hungry, except for those that are in a new relationship already. Um, it's yeah. a very lonely place to not be mm. intimate with somebody, to not have the physical touch. And something that also came up with me um, were the love languages. Some people have physical mm. touch as their primary love language. So it's, it's torture to not have that in, in your life. It's yeah. really, yeah, um, to be deprived of that is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. this is so interesting. There are so many things to do. There are so many schools of thought and, and practices and exercises that are out there and available. It's unbelievable. I'm sure many, most people are not aware of all these things because in the, in the, in the like you said, in the Western society, or most most of our cultures, it's not really, it's a taboo subject, let alone something that we talk about with our partners. Not even to mention talk about some with somebody else. That's 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 mm. not our intimate partner. So um, you talked about breast massage for women. What can a man do who's lonely and skin hunger, yeah. hungry? Skin hungry. I, I would also recommend going going for a massage, right? Just to have that touch. Um, for men, obviously, like you're not going to do breast massage, but like if, in, again, I'm generalizing, but yes. generally, like I think it's easier for men to still connect to their turn on and their desire, even if they have been like quote unquote rejected, right? Where where women might again generalizing because there are outliers on yes. both groups. Yeah. So. Um, what could be really, really nice for men if they are going to masturbate in any case, right? Like you might, you might actually masturbate as a relief, like maybe to porn or whatever, just to like feel good for a moment. But conscious genital touch is actually a really beautiful practice. And all it basically means is you don't use a, like an accelerator, like porn or fantasy, but you literally just give your penis like a massage, the same way that you would give yourself a foot massage, mm -hmm. where you really get into the corners and you take it very slow and you use some oil. And it is just really to bring back conscious awareness, conscious attention. There's a very big difference between just, you know, masturbating like a forest monkey for an orgasm mm -hmm. and slowing down, being present. It can be a very nourishing practice in, in a very, very deep way. And it's a very, 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 very small minority of men that even know or realize that they can touch themselves like this because it's not something people ever talk about. But yeah, so let's call it like conscious penis massage. Um, can absolutely do that. Just consciously connecting with your body physically and yeah. self-touch. Um, is so important. Yeah. We we raised in all cultures that that's not a good thing to do, not acceptable. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, so if you, and this, I'm a big fan of a timer because again, it creates that space where you know that for the next 15 to 20 minutes, you're not going to do anything else. So when thoughts come up in your head of like, oh, did I reply to that email or is it time for dinner yet? You can just see those thoughts. You can acknowledge them and then come back to your body because mind does that. It's like when we do something that's maybe for self-care, and this is something that happens during sex with a lot of people. When people say, I'm in my head during sex, like either they're thinking of the past or they're worrying about the future, but they're not present in the moment. And the same will happen when you start giving yourself like self-touch and self-massage, the mind will come in, the thoughts will come in and like tell you stories. But if you have a timer, you can just say, we'll check in in 15 minutes or I'll answer the email in 15 minutes or whatever it is. So you can come back again. And then in those 15 minutes, like make it really nice, like put your favorite music on, have some oil and go slow. So it's kind of like you're exploring your body with the palms of your hands. It's very, very different. It's a very different um, feeling than if you're just drying yourself after a shower or putting some soap on, right? Interesting, because the first time you said time, I thought, oh, okay, now this is too rigid. But then listening to you, I realized that it's actually time that you set aside, that you take for yourself. It almost gives you permission to just indulge in, uh, what you, in, yes. in yourself, so to speak, yeah. all that time, yeah. because you know there comes a point where you will go back to, to yeah. the rest of your life. And then when the timer goes off and it's over, then it's over, right? Yes. So um, what I also found, with because I, do, I give a lot of practices to my clients, and I find sometimes people get overwhelmed with the idea of, uh, like I don't have time for a 30 minute practice or oh, no, I must do this thing and it's going to take half a day. But if you give them a short little bite of time to work yes. in, I really believe that there's freedom within boundaries, like even in relationships, like if you have clear boundaries, you can be so free within it. Mm. But if you don't have boundaries, then there could be fear, thoughts or worries coming in because you haven't set boundaries. Mm. You don't know what the thing is that you're playing in. And I feel the same about time. Time boundaries allows you freedom within those boundaries. Yes. So listening to you, I'm wondering, what do you say to people about making time to be intimate, to have to enjoy sex because uh, once uh, the children have been put to bed and the dishes have been washed and everything's been done, uh, most people are exhausted. They just want to fall down yeah. and crash because this, this this intimate part always happens at the end of the day, so to speak, mm -hmm. generally, uh, from what I've seen with the people that I work with. Uh, yeah. What 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 healthy advice do you have for that? Mm. So the first thing I want to say is like, we, usually when I speak to couples, they would say, you know, like we really struggle to have sex just in a normal life. But when we go away for a weekend, like mm. it's so easy for us to have sex. And so what is that weekend? It is a time container that they've agreed on where they are free. right? Mm. And like may, maybe there are children, maybe there aren't. But it's just that now they're not in the routine of life that just swallows you. Mm. So. I, and I know it sounds super boring, but I'm really, really a fan of like a time agreement around sex. So if both people are working from home, you could totally do this on like a Wednesday morning at 11, just after you've had your coffee, you have a lot of energy, and maybe you can both make time in your schedule. And I would literally say, put this in your schedule. Um, I know not everyone is a schedule person, but I find that if something's in my schedule, it happens. If it's not in my schedule, it doesn't happen. So if you want sex to happen or intimate time to happen, put it in a schedule. Who cares? Would you rather just not have sex and like week upon week, desire it, not have it, grow resentful, blame your partner, go down that spiral? Or would you just leave your stories about scheduled sex is boring and just have, again, that time container. And then what happens in that time container can be spontaneous because people want spontaneity. They want adventure. They don't want scheduling. But this, the schedule is just the time that you agree on. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in there? Like maybe you give each other an erotic massage. Maybe you have penetrative sex. Maybe you just cuddle. Like that's where it gets spontaneous. But we live in a very fast world where so much is happening all the time. And I just personally see that if you set time aside, it's more likely to happen. And that's what you want in the end. Uh I have a question. 
Hmm. I, I hear it so often with people that are separated and going through a divorce process, uh, mostly women, but I must say many men also, they have this idea that they have to get into shape first or lose weight first. Uh, they have to do something or improve their physique or their bodies first before they will consider sex or in intimacy. Um, does it make sense to do it like that in that order or it, it seems to me that one must, your sexuality or your sensuality is not necessarily uh, linked to your physique, although I think mm. it makes a difference to our self-confidence and that sort of stuff. Yeah. What, how would you, how would you uh, guide somebody who feels that they have to lose weight first or get into shape first yeah. before they can be attractive or, or be sexual? Mm. Well, I, I think you had the exact right phrase there, which is like, it's, it's tied to self-confidence. So what we need to work on is not the body, but is the self-confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Because someone who lacks that self-confidence could lose five or 10 kilograms and then still not feel confident. Mm -hmm. They could change their hair color and still not feel confident because we can always create. And I like that you said you see it mostly with women because I do think women are more attached to the beauty standard, right? You can always create a story around like either you're too young or you're too old, either your breasts are too big or they're too small, either your uh, stomach is too floppy or it's too tight, right? You can always create a story of I am too full in the black. So it's not really about the physical appearance because I can tell you for free that there are many men who are very attracted to more fuller bodied women who want more meat if you can be like really blunt about it, right? They prefer like a curvier woman, but that woman might think like, oh, I need to lose 10 kilograms before anyone will find me attractive. But it's, it's literally not true. Um, so the question here is not about the body. The question is like, why do you not have self-confidence? And I think something like a divorce can really, really play havoc with your self-confidence because you might feel like you failed at something really big or maybe there was something like infidelity. And that is the core wound. And so that's where I would start building it up from is that self-acceptance, self-love, and then self-confidence that comes from there rather than losing five kgs. And if you lose five kgs in the process, you know, so be it. But that's the core is the self-confidence. Yeah, very true. True words indeed. And I think um, if our self confidence improves or our self-worth goes up then we kind of mm. tend to be more successful at any other task that we set to ourselves so losing weight or sticking to an exercise program uh, for example would also go better once our confidence and our self-worth yeah. uh, improves eh? absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah okay so let's get to the orgasm um i think yes. we've talked about <laughs> everything around it and all of this leads to it your your self-image your confidence your comfort your level of comfort with your own body and and, and uh, also what's another word the, the how well you know your own body um yes all leads into being sexually uh, aroused and getting fulfilled if i can say it that way hmm why do people have problems with orgasm? Because it's a common thing. Yeah, yeah. So again, I would say it's more psychological than it is physiological, even though for some people, very, very, very small amount of people, it can be something physiological, right? But overwhelming majority, it's psychological. And what I believe is like orgasm comes from a state of surrender. So they've done, there was a study that they did long ago where they took MRI scans of women's brains as they orgasmed. And what they saw is that the prefrontal cortex switches off at the moment of orgasm. So this is like your judging part, your thinking part, your, criti your criticizing part is not online in a way during the moment of orgasm which then inversely means that if you are stuck in a place of self-criticism, like, can you see my cellulite? Or does my stomach look big in this light? Or I wonder if he's having fun. You know, when you have all of those what if thoughts, those parts of your brain are so active that it's more difficult to get into orgasm. So it helps to have a sort of surrender. It makes 
orgasm more accessible to people. So, so really doing work. So I, I like this idea of mindfulness during sex, right? Because we spoke about it earlier. I hear so many people, especially women say, I'm in my head during sex. I don't know how to get out of my head during sex. And mindfulness is a really great practice. And so sex is such a physical experience that there's so much physical that you can uh, focus on. So you could have a day where you decide you're just going to focus on your breath while you are having sex. And that brings you into the present. It brings you into your body. Or you're only going to focus on sensation. And you're not making a story about it. You just feel, oh, I feel this sensation there. Then I feel this sensation there. Then I feel, you're not qualifying it. You're not wondering, why am I not feeling anything there? You're literally just focusing on sensation. There's well, a lot of yeah. different things you can focus on, but a one-pointed focus. Mm -hmm. So that mindful. Yes. And that makes orgasm more accessible. So that's one part. That's one part of how you can how you can make it so that you're more likely to have an orgasm and have a good orgasm, right? Because there's always like the also the little sneeze orgasms, and then there's an orgasm that comes from much deeper and can be quite transformational, actually. Mm -hmm. Bring up emotion, um, like help you feel very connected, release like a lot of oxytocin, which makes you feel very connected. So that's one thing. And the other thing that you mentioned is people not knowing their bodies. So what is really interesting for me is like there's still a lot of people that don't really understand, especially female genital anatomy. So I was reading about a study like YouGov or something that the study where they showed people like men and women, a diagram of the female reproductive system, right? Inside and outside. And interestingly enough, almost everyone could identify the clitoris which is usually like what most women need stimulated in order to have an orgasm. Yeah. But only about 50% of the participants could identify or could name the labia and only 50% could name the vagina, which I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. And what I heard, what I keep hearing in, let's say like culture or common conversation is that people refer to the entire external genital structure of women as the vagina mm -hmm. and it gets my goat in like the biggest way because it's not right mm -hmm. and I hear women often say like whatever like oh my underwear is um covering my vagina and I'm like but then they mean they mean the pubic hair they mean the vulva they mean the pubis mound mm -hmm. not actually the vagina and so what I really want people to realize is that this is it's a separate thing the vulva is separate from the vagina right the vagina is only the internal structure and so if you don't know your own genitals and you don't know what everything is called how must you now guide someone yeah. in, in in what feels pleasurable like because you're so disconnected from your own body that like you can name everything on your face right why oh. can't you name everything in your panties like, yeah. it's still there it, it blows my mind sorry like I, I know I get quite irate about this <laughs> yeah. learn to know your genitals yeah. And, and the same with um, male genitals as well. It's it's very interesting that you say that. I'm thinking if pornography has perhaps plays a role in that, because mm. in, in most pornography there's a specific focus on specific parts of the of the genitals. Yeah. So oh. one thing that I really think where pornography has done us no service is that it depicts penetration as the main route to orgasm right yeah. you just have these women that are like being banged to kingdom come and they have all of these like epic orgasms the yes. whole time yeah. and so men that are exposed to a lot of pornography which is like almost all men out there um or most men out there so they get this idea of like oh all i need to do is penetrate and thrust and that will bring a woman to orgasm yes. but that is so far from the truth yeah. for yes for some women that's all that needed but I think it's like 18% of women can can orgasm through uh, penetration alone where yeah. the overwhelming majority of women need a lot of clitoral stimulation doesn't matter how like, and a lot of women need to be warmed up first yes. so through through my teacher Leila Martin like I learned this like a seasonal a cyclical model of orgasm which so you look at orgasm in terms of seasons right 
And she says, most women are in winter when they start a sexual encounter. And when you realize that, you so if summer is orgasm, right? And autumn is like the come down from orgasm. So you're working from winter. So first you need to warm up the body. You need like, and this is basically foreplay, but this is why foreplay is so important because you, most bodies, most female bodies can't go from winter to summer in five seconds. You need the winter, you need like the defrosting. You need the trust, you need the safety, you need the relaxation. And then from there, you can start having the arousal. And then arousal can build into expansion and expansion can become climax or this mind shift, this, yeah, it's kind of like a mind shift that happens from one state to another um, in orgasm. So I think that if as a society, we had a softer, almost more feminine approach to orgasm, more women would orgasm. Then there's the, the old thing about the orgasm gap where um, in heterosexual couples, it's the biggest difference between the male partners orgasming and the female partners orgasming, where female partners say they orgasm like less than like 30% of the time and male partners orgasm 95% of the time. And like, why is that? Where in lesbian relationships, there's a much, um, like a much more generous um, balance of orgasm between the two partners. And so what does this show to us? F for me, like my interpretation of that is um, in heterosexual couples, both partners. So this is not to blame men at all. This is not to blame women. Like I want to blame like culture and porn and people not having conversations around this. But there's a male idea or there's an, uh, yeah, let's just call it like a male idea of like, how arousal works and what orgasm is. And so both partners are really um, the ones that must change their thoughts or change their behaviors. And oftentimes women just like are fine with not having an orgasm because they feel it's, oh, I don't want to be that person or I don't want to be a lot of work or I don't want to be an inconvenience. So they almost hold themselves back from their fullest expression of pleasure because they don't want to be the one that takes a long time. And this is something I hear with my clients so often is they fear taking a long time. Like your pleasure is an inconvenience to yourself and your partner. So again, communication is the way out of this mess that we've created for ourselves. Always comes up. I love that image of likening the orgasm or a woman's orgasm to the seasons. Uh, it's beautiful. Mm. It's really beautiful. Uh, yeah. And if you think about way? it like that, sorry, if you think about it like that, you are at peace with where you are. But if you think about it in, let's say like the very linear male, male model of like thought, desire, arousal, orgasm, you're always going to feel less than. You're always going to feel broken or slow or like all of the things that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if we think about it in a cyclical kind of way, winter is beautiful. We don't sit in winter and curse it for being winter. No, winter is winter. Mm -hmm. I think spring is spring. So I feel like there's more of a inner peace when we can adopt that model of thinking around especially female orgasm. Okay, that's my piece. <laughs> and, and it's part of a cycle. It, it leads to mm. something different and something new. It's a cycle. It's not just a, it's not just a thing there that's dead or not working, um, so to speak. Yeah. Exactly. What about women who have who were in relation? I, I've seen that shockingly often women who were married for 20 years and they've never actually ever had an orgasm mm -hmm. yeah so so i would want to know a well a good question to ask is like can you have an orgasm on your own right mm -hmm. because many women who never have orgasms in their relationship can have an orgasm on their own mm -hmm. if they can't have an orgasm on their own I would take a different approach, right? So then we would look at like, what are your stories around orgasm? Again, everything psychological, like unpacking your belief system around orgasm, what is possible for you? Because after 20 years of not having an orgasm, you most likely adopted an identity of like, I am the woman who doesn't orgasm or can't yes. orgasm. Yeah. And so even that can't doesn't really leave a lot of space for orgasm. So, you know, I would work with that. If they can orgasm on their own, but not with a partner, that's a dynamic thing. So are they feeling safe in their relationship? Um, are they taking time? Do they know how to communicate their physical desires? Do they know? Um, I also like looking at arousal and orgasm on the scale from one to 10, where one is like deep winter. It's like not feeling any arousal. Mm -hmm. 10 is orgasm. 
can you communicate to your partner where you are on the scale at different mm-hmm. times during your sexual play, mm-hmm. right? Because also something that often happens to women is like they go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and then and then you, they just give up. So what is the thing? Um, if you read Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are, which I think every couple in the world should read, especially in every woman, um, she talks about like sexual breaks and accelerators. And we all have different breaks and accelerators. So if, you, if you're on the scale of arousal and you feel oh, I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you drop back to a one, there was a break there somewhere. So what was it? Maybe you felt pain. Maybe your partner said something dirty and you actually didn't like it. Maybe uh, you saw your cellulite and it's your, your lack of confidence. That what was the break? That, so you can like, almost like unpack your yes. arousal system. And this is how you figure out what you really want and what your desire is and how to get to orgasm on a more regular basis and how to ask for things. You know, like, can you orgasm through penetration? Do you need oral stimulation? Like, have you, like, do you need like nipple play while you're being penetrated? And the other thing to remember is every body is different. Every body is like a Rubik's cube that you have to figure out for yourself and move with your partner. So don't think because you saw something in porn or read an article that you are going to be like that. You must really figure your own thing out. And I think to give people that permission and that space to explore is really, really important. I think that's very important, very valuable um, thing that you said there. We are all different, and what works in the mm. porn or in the books or with a previous lover will, will not necessarily yes. work with this one. Um, yes. Very, very important because if we have more than one intimate partner in, in a lifespan, they are different. And, and mm. might, uh, people, especially people in long relationships, they, they kind of find a rhythm um, of how they do it. Uh, and they mm. fall into a rut almost, so it's, you know. Yeah, like routine sex. A routine, yeah, routine sex. Or they mm. have a number of things which they know work and they stick to that. Yeah, I, I just, but that can also become boring. That, that's true, yeah. Uh, boredom mm. is, is one of the things I mentioned also um, right in the beginning yeah. that, that has an effect in, in long-term relationships, uh, very mm. much so. But, but talking about all this, the technical, can I call it the technical stuff about orgasms, I've also had um, male clients who have had a profound effect on them when they were unable to uh, assist their partner to reach an orgasm. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the heterosexual relationship, but I'm sure it applies to anybody. Uh, it affects yeah. them also because you, you kind of feel like it's your responsibility to please your partner mm-hmm. and to bring them to a climax. And if that doesn't happen, it, it impacts yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, like, I know of relationships that have actually ended because of, of, of this exact scenario where the one yeah. partner felt like, because then the, the story can start in your head of like, why am I not good enough? Like, why, why can I not give this pleasure yeah. to my partner? Yeah. So again, I'd be interested in like what conversations have they had around it? Do you know if your partner can orgasm on their own? If they can, what is it that they like? Yeah. Again, just but but people find it so tricky to talk about sex and these yeah. kind of like being in the weeds of figuring it out. Um, so yeah, that's why communication again for me is the first step. It comes down to that all the time. And does the yeah. same apply to uh, uh, somebody who uh, cannot get an erection? Is, is it the same um, as uh, is it the same for men who can't get an erection than it is mm. for a woman who just can't uh, reach an orgasm? Is it the same dynamics? Is it the same psychology that applies? Look, I would say with both of them, um, with with men, they can also be like they can be a, again. It can be physiological, and I don't think it's a bad idea to go see a doctor about it, but most of the time it is something psychological and it, again like i would want to look at like what was your upbringing around sex right like do you have a lot of shame around sex um do you have a maybe they have like sexual preferences that they're very ashamed to communicate to their partner yeah. um what what is it so more often than not i would say there is a belief system or a, a psychological block um behind that um 
yeah, I also feel for men because I mean, like the penis is always expected to like get hard quickly, like yeah. give pleasure, um, ejaculate strongly. It's a lot of pressure on men, you know? Yes. So for me, there's almost even an invitation there, especially if someone is struggling with erectile dysfunction to slow it down a lot. Yeah. And I'm personally a big uh, <laughs> evangelist for, um, in the, you know, like in the more, uh, spiritual world they'll call it yoni and linga massage mm -hmm. i call it penis and pussy massage so to learn how to give genital massage to your partner and there's a very big difference between like a hand job or a, um, a finger job and a, a penis massage or a pussy massage right the main difference being you you warm up a lot more of the body um, let's say take a penis massage for example so say someone struggles with premature ejaculation or erectile dysfunction, um, a penis massage could be so good for them to like just bring like sexual and like arousal energy like to their penis without any expectation of something specific happening. Yes. Because you can give a 45 minute penis massage to your male partner and they can be flaccid throughout the whole thing. And there's no shame, there's no expectation. So I think to be in a in an erotic situation where there is zero expectation of strong, hard, blah, 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 all of the things that get put onto men, mm. like that can be very, very healing. And it might take some time, right? You know, it might mean showing up for weekly penis massages like um, for a while, but I really believe like it can bring something back to someone, mm. especially with erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful, that's good to know. All right, mm. well, we can talk about this for days, I think. But <laughs> let's start wrapping it up. Please give us some inspiring food for thought after this. Our bodies are made for, for joy and ecstasy and sex is fun and having an orgasm is absolutely amazing and awesome mm. and there's so many ways to do it. Um, what, what can you tell us going ahead from this? Okay, I've, I've gone through a separation. I'm divorced now. I'm ready for a new relationship i'm keen to fall in love again i'm eager or if i'm not hmm. what is it about intimacy and sex and having orgasms that's so good for us because hmm. it is it's, it's really good for us it is like uh, even like chemically it's good for us right like there's a lot of chemicals that get released in the brain like some of them as i said like oxytocin which connects you there are anti-aging chemicals that get released um there are things that can um some people say i can't remember the chemicals name now i'll have to go yeah. back to the book uh, that can that um has some evidence of being like cancer withholding what is the word i'm looking for like it stops cancer from forming in your body so there are so many like not just yummy but like really physiologically beneficial chemicals that get released in your body um obviously like we're we're mammals we're we're herd creatures like we love being with other people so sex give you, gives you this opportunity to be like naked physically and like emotionally to be vulnerable to to be seen right like to to be fully seen in moments of ecstasy to be fully seen like with your naked body like there's something really beautiful about it and so i think like not to underestimate how how healing intimacy can be to us and if you just want like a really nice fuck that like, that's also fine right it doesn't have to be like this deeply entangled romance um if you really just like want to go have fun, like give yourself permission to do that as well, that freedom, that liberation. Mm -hmm. So think about like what you want and what, what your soul is craving at that stage. Hmm. Wonderful. That sounds beautiful. And it, it is, it, it, that's exactly what it is. It's medicine. Uh, yeah. It's actually yeah, like a, a, a potion um, of continuous youth. What's the word I'm looking for? It's like a, keeps you from like growing a fountain up. of youth fountain of youth there we go that's yeah. even better yeah and if you, if you look at like sorry yeah please go ahead um, if you if you look at Taoist practices, right? And yes, like they look at it more through like a very soft meditative cultivation of these kind of energies but you see the the lower energy center in our bodies so that would be like our genitals, our pelvis, our wombs, that is like the, the main energy center of your body. And if that energy center is full and healthy, the other energy centers get fed by it, right? If you have like a full, healthy, wholesome sex, 
and it doesn't have to be sex life, but like even if you touch yourself or if you, um, you know, like cultivate that energy, it can then feed, feed you in other senses, in your spiritual practice, in your being out in the world. So from, from that perspective, you know, it really gives you energy for life in a way. So it's not just something that we do for like fun and orgasm. It's also something that nourishes us. And many people say it keeps you young as well. So, you know, if there's, <laughs> it's like the best anti-aging thing. So why not? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Mm. Thank you so much, Marilu. That was insightful and inspiring also. And I hope everybody who watched enjoyed this um, or is watching at the moment. I will put Marilu's contact details in the comments below this video, wherever it's posted. So you will know how to track her down. She does amazing work. And um, yes, I've, 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 we've touched on several things that could um, be separate topics for discussion so I'm, I'm hoping to see you mm. back here again soon but thank you so much to do this again. Uh, it was wonderful <laughs> thanks, to okay thanks so much okay <laughs>